The world seems to be exploding in protest. And I think it's worth not only putting that protest across the globe into geographic context, but putting it into historical context. I think we can look about this entire cycle of news events, not only into the motivations of climate change ideology, but we can look into this and see the base human desire for power and control and the ugly, ugly outcomes throughout history. Citizens have stormed the capital of Albania this week, upset over rising inflation and a cratering economy. We talked last week about the Dutch farmer protest in Holland. In Holland, farmers have taken to the streets and driven their tractors into the capital, the Hague of Holland, to protest reductions in fertilizer use, an attempt to control the amount of nitrogen oxide in the soil, in livestock waste, ammonia, through the practice of farming and ranching. Dutch farmers are worried these policies will put them out of business. Meanwhile, in Sri Lanka, we're watching the biggest set of protests yet on the globe. Thousands of people late last weekend stormed the capital of the president. As we speak, the president of Sri Lanka is globetrotting, bouncing around from the Maldives to Saudi Arabia to wherever else he can hide from the wrath of his own people. The prime minister's palace has also been invaded. People are sitting there using the treadmills of the opulence of power while they are suffering under north of 50 percent inflation. The Sri Lankan economy is in tatters. Supply chain is broken. And not unlike Holland, farmers are on the verge of being put out of business. How did this happen? Here is the diagnosis of the current events. As in Holland, where there is a green energy climate change initiative from the EU to control the nitrogen oxide and ammonia in the environment to preserve natural habitat and thus, in their own words, putting farmers out of business in Sri Lanka. Yes, it's true. The pandemic and supply chain helped exacerbate some inflation we we're seeing across the globe. But in Sri Lanka, they also bought into green climate change policies that had a direct effect on their economy. What specifically? Well, one year ago, cold turkey, Sri Lanka outlawed chemical fertilizer. They wanted the entire farming industry of that country to move to organic fertilization. This, of course, is a disaster. Crop yields down, I think, more than 50 percent. Farmers out of business. The food supply clearly destroyed. So what is going on? Why are economies across the world suffering not just from inflation, but from food shortages? And that is something we've heard hinted at, that we can peer far down the road and maybe prepare to expect here in the United States. And the answer is the Great Reset. Look, the pandemic did play its part in punishing world economies. You cannot shut world economies down. You cannot break supply chains and expect it to bounce back. If there's any lesson from the pandemic, and quite honestly, if there's any politicians, and I would suggest to you all politicians who participated in prolonging lockdowns who should pay, these politicians who were once in power should never again be granted the levers of power. They must pay the price. They must be punished at a minimum with their careers. But Beyond lockdowns and beyond broken supply chains, global elites saw the pandemic as an opportunity to hit the reset button, to begin the Great Reset. That's not a conspiracy theory. To be clear, you can hear it in their own words. Listen. Now, that is sound from the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum put on every year of the world's global elite, not just presidents and prime ministers, but bankers, celebrities, and billionaires. The agenda of the 
2021 World Economic Forum was the Great Reset. The presumption being we cannot return to the status quo. The status quo is what led us to this moment. We have to envision a brighter future. Quotes such as, we have to continue the inevitable march of progress came out of things like the World Economic Forum's Great Reset. As part of that, as you and I have discussed in the past, world governments adopted green policies to reflect one another from Canada to New Zealand, to Australia, to Sri Lanka, to Holland, to across the EU. This was not just reflected in government policies. No, as we mentioned, the World Economic Forum is much bigger than simply governments. Banks across the world had already begun and now have leaned in heavily to a new form of investing, which, by the way, is intricately intertwined with world governments called ESG. And that is... environmental, social, and governance initiatives in selecting your investments. You have funds, ETF funds, mutual funds. You have corporate board mission statements that now revolve around ESG scores. Uh, You get a better score if you perform better on your effect on the environment. It's a scam, by the way. It's the latest scam of, quite honestly, corporatists. Not so much capitalists, but corporatists in the finance and banking world that can sell you a new form of mutual fund that you can feel warm and fuzzy about. When is it any more green? Well, as the Wall Street Journal wrote last week, many of these ESG funds have investments not in Tesla, for example, but in Exxon or GM, for example. Why? Because who knows what makes up an ESG score? It's simply another tool of the combination of big business, elite, and government to control not just you and our lives but to control the world and we will at least grant them for the sake of this conversation the premise of good intentions let's talk about good intentions at the moment the inevitable march towards progress if you would indulge me let's look back in history i recently watched a movie i was bouncing around i think it was on netflix it may have been on amazon prime and i watched a movie called Mr. Jones. The movie was about a Welsh journalist in the 1930s who had studied and was interested in the Soviet Union. What he realized is you never really get the story of what's happening in the Soviet Union if you always spend your time in Moscow. You have to get out of Moscow. You have to see what is going on. And what was going on in the Soviet Union in the 1930s is one of the greatest tragedies of humankind. And it was also one of the greatest tragedies that we know so little about because It's covered up, of course, chronologically, by one of the greatest villainries of all time in Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust. But, and forgive me if my numbers are not exact, where 11 million individuals, Jews, gypsies, communists, were killed in the Holocaust, estimates are some 3 to 7 million people were killed just 7 or 8 years earlier by the Soviet Union, of famine in Ukraine. Isn't it interesting how history and current events work like a wheel? It always comes back around. Here's the story of Holodomor. I hope my pronunciation is correct, but Holodomor is the story of the Ukrainian famine of 1932 and 1933. Ukraine wasn't alone. Soviet Union policies that induced famine across their empire took place not just in Ukraine, but in places as well, like Kazakhstan. Millions upon millions of people were killed. Why? Well, not unlike the Great Reset, the Soviet Union was taking a big step in the march towards progress. They were looking at the great industrialization. They were looking at moving their economy from rural and agricultural to urban and industrial. Why? To keep up the war machine, to compete with Britain, and to anticipate the next war, and to show the power, at least the superficial power, of communism. So what happened? Policies to collectivize agriculture took place. Farms were confiscated. 
they had a class of peasants, three classes of peasants, in fact, that some of whom suffered under these collectivization policies and others benefited. They set massive, unreachable quotas of grain and agricultural products that had to be sent into Moscow and other centers so the Soviet Union could export food products in exchange for industrial expertise, knowledge, and products coming back. And in that process of high quotas and lower production from the collectivization efforts, because, of course, you're not going to produce under collectivization the way you are when you empower individual incentive, more on that in just a moment, you had a tragic, devastating, dark, anti-human cocktail. People in Ukraine, the breadbasket, the black lands of the Soviet Union suddenly had nothing to eat. Bodies dropping in the streets. This is what Jones saw when he traveled outside of Moscow. He got to Ukraine and people were fighting each other over bread crust, literally. And we're not talking about anecdotally one or two. We're talking about bodies piling up and being carted away. We're talking about people, children, laying on the roadside. We're talking about, and this is historically documented, mass cannibalism. People were eating tree bark and each other in order to survive. I want to talk to you for just a moment about those peasants and those policies. So people, as human beings are apt to do, don't just want to give up their property, their hard-earned work. So instead of turning over, for example, their livestock to the local Politburo of the Soviets, which were their neighbors, by the way. It's always neighbor upon neighbor. It's always neighbor upon neighbor. It was in East Germany, and it was during COVID, by the way, in the United States of America. It's always neighbor versus neighbor. That's how control is really accomplished. Very rarely is a jackbooted soldier the one that comes into town and stands directly over your demise. Whether or not it was your neighbor ratting on you during COVID or it was Ukrainians one decade later committing the atrocities of Bobby Yar the Holocaust mass slaughter of Jews, the Nazis helped coordinate, but it was other Ukrainians who pulled the trigger. And same thing during Holodomor, it was your neighbor who stole from you. It was your neighbor who confiscated your farm. It was your neighbor who stood over your demise. People didn't want that, so they slaughtered their own livestock. They were going to just turn it over. And there was always a villain. There always has to be a villain when you pit one group against another pandemic of the unvaccinated has to be a villain always jews in the holocaust the villain for the soviet famine was a class of peasants called kulaks kulaks were peasants who happened to own some land might have employed other people owned some livestock they could own anywhere north of seven acres and you would be defined as an enemy of the revolution a class enemy and those kulaks were not only jailed they were sent away to, to gulags. They were sent away to Siberia and oftentimes directly exterminated as enemies of the class while their neighbors took over their farms. Now, that in and of itself, dekulakization, is a tragedy of tyranny. Tyranny, like history, is a circle, a wheel. Eventually, communists and fascists are standing right next to each other. So... The end result, that in of itself, tragic enough, but the end result is now with increased demands for quotas in supply, but lower supply because of collectivization, you have mass starvation and mass famine. By some estimates, procurement quotas were up 50%. Hey, you need to produce 50% more wheat, while production dropped 32%. That's a massive gap. And that adds up to local population having nothing to eat. That adds up to bodies in the street. That adds up to cannibalism. Now, it's always the case, and we're going to tie this into modern history and Sri Lanka and ESG and climate change in one moment. But it's important to note, as is always the case, there is someone ready to carry the water for tyranny. And it more often than not is liberal and progressive journalists. And even then, those that work for institutions like the New York Times. In Moscow in the 1930s, there was a New York Times reporter named Walter Durante. Walter Durante had all kinds of 
sexual deviances, and he was a man who loved luxury. He accomplished that in Moscow. Sex parties, wild orgies of food and sex, drugs, heroin, everything went on at Durante's house. He was living the life of our man in Moscow while people were starving in the hinterlands. But what did he have to do to live that life of opulence? Carry the water for Stalin. And he did so. Durante reported on the amazing industrialization of the Soviet Union. And make no mistake, there were some steps on the march towards, quote unquote, progress. They did industrialize. Oh, the Soviet Union did take those steps. The question is, as always, and as will be today, hey, how many eggs are worth breaking to make a few omelets? Durante painted a picture for the American public back in New York and the United States of America as look at the wonders of Soviet communism. Look at the advances in industrialization. And yes, there have been some downstream effects of a reduction in food supply. But I want you to see if this doesn't sound familiar to modern times. What he had mastered, and George Orwell talked about this, was the art of dark communication. In other words, instead of saying there's mass death from starvation, manipulating language. So you say something like this increased mortality due to complication of diseases from malnutrition. I mean, tell me that doesn't ring a bell of whatever you want to apply it to in modern day journalism from gender to COVID. How do you take something obvious and turn it into an impenetrable sentence? It didn't just start now. They have a long history of it. And oh, have they been rewarded? Walter Durante, for that type of opaque language, increased mortality due to complications of disease from malnutrition, with millions of people dying and resorting to cannibalism, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. For that coverage, not only was he published in the New York Times, he was awarded the highest of honors in journalism. In fact, although he is long gone, Walter Durante's Pulitzer Prize remains. They have had a chance, no doubt, to revisit this issue as the truth of the Soviet Union came out over time and it took decades and really wasn't fully realized until it fell in the 90s. As the truth came out, the Pulitzer Committee had a chance to revoke Walter Durante's Pulitzer Prize, but they chose not to. A man named Sig Gissler, who was a professor of journalism once at Columbia and then at Stanford, decided not to, result, to revoke Durante's Pulitzer. There's always someone ready to break a few eggs to make an omelet. Now, let's bring that back to the modern day. World governments are once again taking steps on their quote-unquote march towards progress. They're hitting not the great industrialization, not the great leap forward, not the great society. They are hitting the great reset. They, and once again... We'll grant them at least as some kernel of good intentions want to see a greener, you know, more harmonic, more sustainable in their own words, vision of the future. But what we have to understand is this philosophy of breaking a few eggs to make a few omelets of the Great Reset of climate change ideology isn't just incompetent. It isn't just ignorant of history and it isn't just a reach for power it is also inherently whether or not is subconscious or even unconscious deeply anti-human here's what i mean one more quick rewind into history human beings have always thought that we are somehow destroying inevitably the earth Thomas Malthus thought we were overpopulating the earth in the 1800s and food supplies would never be able to keep up. And he argued for population control. He was wrong. We figured out fertilizer. We figured out industrialization. We figured out the internal combustion engine. And then we figured out cross modification, genetic modification of food. And world population has not just exploded, but world prosperity has exploded. Malthus was horrendously wrong. In the 1960s, men and not just nobodies like Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren, again, predicted overpopulation and mass death and the destruction of the earth. For that, like Durante being awarded the Pulitzer Prize, they were awarded the highest levels 
of government. Holdren became Barack Obama's czar of science. They made incredibly bad predictions, such as by the year 2000, the UK would be nothing but an island of a few million starving individuals. I'm telling you, they have been more wrong than, well, most of your sports commentators. I'm pretty good. You know that. Look, I get it wrong a lot. I know. Coward. Bayless. Sharp. Stephen A. Get it wrong. They got nothing. They got nothing on Holdren and Ehrlich. So why? Why does it not matter that they're constantly wrong? Because they believe that human beings are inherently antagonistic to the flourishment of the earth. And if you have to put in a few green policies, if you have to hit the Great Reset, if you have to reduce food supply, and if that's even a unintended consequence, well, it has an intended benefit. Fewer humans to impact the earth. Fewer carbon emissions. Oh, they may rationalize it, especially at the lower levels, especially among your neighbors. They may rationalize it. Oh, we've got to make it sustainable. Oh, we're going to lose Miami to big waves. We've got to save it for our grandchildren. But make no mistake, that's not good enough when you're ignorant of the actual implications. And the implications always start in the poorest parts of the world. 50% of Africa has no electricity. You want to control carbon? You're going to put them out of, well, the ability to produce food. You're going to put them out of the ability to keep babies alive in incubators. You're going to start killing, at the very least, reducing the lifespan and then killing the population of the poorest. That's why you'll see that first in Albania and in Sri Lanka, where you're looking at food shortages, farmers going out of business, runaway inflation. That will lead to the loss of human life. And if you're okay with that, because, hey, the world's more sustainable, it's greener, then your policies are not just ignorant of history and not just a power grab, but your policies are anti-human. They lead to death and starvation. Last note, in the Great Reset, of course, not everybody will suffer from reduced lifespans. Not everybody will suffer from food shortages. There will always be a Walter Durante. There will always be Moscow. There will always be some place where there's a feast while somewhere else there's a famine. So the real question is, in the Great Reset, the real question is, if not everybody will have reduced lifespans, not everybody will suffer premature deaths, not everybody will watch their children starve, who in this modern time will be the Kulaks? Hey, it's Will Cain. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Cain podcast for full episodes right now.